Alex Epstein, who's a former colleague of ours at the Ayn Rand Institute, has just published a powerful new book on energy and climate change. Fossil Future makes the radically unconventional argument that to achieve a better world, we need to be expanding our use of fossil fuel energy, not decreasing it. Now, there are many books out there that challenge the kind of alarmist perspective on climate change, but this new book takes a unique and highly original approach to the subject. Welcome to New Ideal, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm Keith Lockich, and joining me today is my colleague, Nikos Soterokopoulos. Hi, Nikos. Hi, Keith. So we've done a number of podcasts related to Alex's work on this book in the last couple of months. Um, we did one on Earth Day, and we did a couple of others related to that. Um, but that was all before the book, before Fossil Future was published. So now the book has just came out, has just come out. It came out last week. So now people can read the book and might have questions about it. Um, so we thought we would do another podcast. Um, we really, I, I, I really view this book as an important work. And I think it, I, I, I think it, uh, I want to see it get as wide attention and, and, um, uh, readership as possible. So we wanted to do another podcast where we where we now we can really go into now that the book is out there and people can judge for themselves. We wanted to kind of go deeper into what are the arguments in this book and what's distinctive and valuable about it. Also, I just wrote an article for our journal New Ideal, which is sort of a review of the book so people can read that as well. But part of what I'm doing in this article is I'm comparing and contrasting fossil future to a couple of other books that have also come out in the last couple of years that also are sort of challenging the alarmist perspective on climate change. So these are these are all good, valuable books. I don't agree with everything in them, um, but there's a set of recent books that are sort of pushing back on this, the idea that we face this world ending apocalypse and that they're trying to give a more sober, objective perspective on these issues. Um, so maybe we could just quickly mention, put the covers of those books up. Um, so we're talking about fossil future, but we're also in my article, I'm contrasting it with, um, so there's, there's fossil future. We're contrasting it with, um, why don't we go down the list here? So, yeah. So one of the books is called Unsettled by Stephen Coonan. Stephen Coonan is a, is a physicist and a climate policy leader for decades, and he's, he delves pretty deeply into a lot of the scientific questions. You know, the title of his book is everyone says the science is settled and he's looking at ways in which the science is not really settled. Um, so that's a really valuable book from that point of view. Um, another really valuable book is Apocalypse Never by Michael Schellenberger. Um, so again, you know, you can see it in the title. It's like Apocalypse Now? No, Apocalypse Never. Like we're not facing the end of the world here. And, and his subtitle, Why Environmental Alarmism Hurts Us All. The real problem we face is the overreacting and the exaggeration. We will we'll end up adopting policies that are actually harmful if we are panicked by hysteria and these apocalyptic perspectives. So this is also a really valuable work. And the last one we wanted to call out here Bjorn Lomborg's false alarm. Um, so again, false alarm. It's like we're 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 panicked into this alarmist perspective, but it's it's there, there's a lot that's inaccurate about that, and we need to have a more sober, objective perspective. So so these are all really valuable books. Um, but what I argue in my article is that they all take a certain approach that that is similar, and. Alex Epstein in Fossil Future takes a very different approach and it's and it leads to an argument that I think is much more powerful and much more uh, potentially impactful in this whole debate. Um, yeah. So I've read uh, Bjorn Lomog as well. And uh, I remember particularly in the days where I was very much influenced by a leftist environmentalist narrative these facts that Lombard presented had a huge impact on me, but they didn't have an impact on me in terms of questioning the merits of environmentalism as a philosophy or the merits of environmentalism as being essentially good. So the idea was, look, what environmentalists are telling us is praiseworthy. It's, it's, a, it's an aim that we should position ourselves towards. So it's, it's something which is worthwhile 
pursuing. But in the application, there are some problems. And um, again, this is a very worthwhile work. But again, not questioning the essential, don't, not questioning the basic premises, to put it this way, of, a, of an ideology or of a movement is less powerful than actually what Alex Epstein is doing. So to use an example yeah. from a different area rather than environmentalism, think about how many classical liberals or some liberal think tanks, for example, when we have a new tax or a new regulation, they bring facts and they say, look, if, for example, we implement this sugar tax, uh, the, well, the less well off are going to hurt by 2% and actually the consumption of sugar is go going to go down only 1%. I mean, this is important information to have, but it does not question the main issue here, which is, should there be a sugar tax? Should the state, for example, is it moral for the state to tell us how to live? And taking this and applying it to, and to how we understand environmentalism and the issues of energy, this is what Alex Epstein does in Fossil Future. He's questioning the main moral paradigm based on which everything we hear about climate change is based so this is the this is how this book is as you said at a completely different level and more persuasive than the other books which again are very praiseworthy but i don't think they're going to have this big impact in someone's thinking to say oh it's not only that the numbers don't add up it's that i should question the whole paradigm and the whole narrative of the way this issue is being discussed yeah, so let's let's dig into that and let's uh, you know support that claim for the audience as we go through. So, it, it translated onto this issue, I think what I would say about the other books is the primary focus that they take is is on the issue of sort of refuting the alarmism, and you can even see this in the subtitles if you if you caught those when we flashed them on the screen. So the subtitle is a false alarm is how climate change panic costs us trillions, hurts the poor, and fails to fix the planet. So it's sort of like the panic is a negative and we're kind of refute that negative or unsettled, you know, what the subtitles, what climate science tells us, what it doesn't and why it matters. So, you know, is the science right or what do we need to have a right, proper perspective on the science here? Apocalypse Never, I, I already said this one, you know, why environmental alarmism hurts us all. So there's this negative out there this, this uh, alarmist perspective on these issues, and that's a bad thing. And we're gonna, and their approach that they're taking is we're gonna refute that bad thing, um, you know, and try to, and that's the, what we're gonna advocate is that we have a more rational perspective on these issues. So all of the facts and the, the, the detailed work that they do in refuting some of these issues, the alarmist perspective on these issues is super valuable. And you need that concrete level of detail to, you know, achieve that more rational perspective on these issues. But it's the what well, one of the first thing we want to highlight here is is that one of the things that's really distinctive about the argument in fossil future is right from the beginning of the book there's a focus on making the positive making the case for a positive not just we're not just trying to um, refute this negative we're trying to make the positive case for something and the positive case it is um, you know, we, we, what we hear every day in the culture is climate change is going to be this apocalyptic thing. Um, in order to prevent it, we have to stop using fossil fuels. We can do that easily because there's all kinds of ways to replace them with solar and wind and da, da, da. So fossil fuels are unnecessary and destructive and we have to get rid of them. Now, what gets completely ignored in the whole discussion is you know, if that's the case, like why are fossil fuels so ubiquitous? Why, what, are, what are the benefits that we get from using fossil fuel that results in the fact that, you know, after 50 years of people, you know, raising the alarm about climate change, fossil fuels still make up more than 80% of the energy that the world uses. And it's, it's, it's not like we just use them for no reason. There's the, the we get, we get certain indispensable benefits from fossil fuels that you just don't get from other kinds of energy sources, no, you know, no matter after 50 years of subsidies and, and incentives thrown at our societies trying to ramp up solar and wind, you know, uh, we, we still are, are this dependent on fossil fuels. And there's a reason for that. And so one of the things that, that Epstein does in his book is the whole 
first part of the book is a is a lengthy, detailed elaboration of the benefits that we get from using fossil fuels. I was going to, oh, I was talking about the subtitles. You can see that this, this different focus is reflected in, even in the subtitle of Alex's book. His sub subtitle is, you know, it's not while environmental alarmism is bad, it's why, it's why global human flourishing requires more oil, coal, and natural gas, not less. So it's, you know, he's got a positive vision, um, a future where billions of people are empowered to live better, you know, better lives, happier lives, uh, uh, more able to flourish and prosper. Um, that's the vision that he's upholding. And part of what he's arguing is that contrary to what everybody in our culture thinks today, uh, in order to achieve that future, fossil fuels are play an indispensable role in doing that. And we, and, and he talks a lot in the book about we're not using enough fossil fuels today in order to, you know, in order to spread that prosperity around the world to the billions of people who don't, you know, or who are energy poor today. So you mentioned the issue of uh, benefits and how we never discuss them. And Alex uses an example, which is very familiar to us because it was very prevalent very recently, which was the issue of how we discuss the vaccines. So how did we deal, for example, with people who would only talk about the counter effects or some side negative side effects of the vaccines, and they never talked about how they saved millions and millions of lives? And we talk for, for, about the COVID vaccines. And Alex says something very interesting. He says, the people who don't even bring in the discussion the positives, we have to be a bit suspicious for them about what is the prism they view, even the negative. So these are people who we shouldn't dismiss what they say, because maybe they, they, what they bring on table have some merit. But the mere fact that they don't talk at all about the positives makes us think that something else is happening here. Make us think that the way they view things uh, has, is under a prism which we might not share. So, for example, in the case of vaccines, there were people who just had the political agenda and they didn't want anything that came out of, I don't know, the CDC or however they would see it. So equally, when we don't talk about the benefits of the fossil fuels, which this is something very big in the book, it's not, as you said, something which is, well, marginal or we could live without. The benefits of fossil fuels are, are everywhere around us. And the benefits of fossil fuels is not only something that we could say, yeah, we can replace. And at the level where we are now, uh, we can replace fossil fuels. But as he says, there are so many billion people who what we take for granted, the energy that we take for granted, they are lacking it. And this energy is essential for them not only to live a better life, but quite often even to survive. So this is how he reframes the discussion. Fossil fuels, first of all, we should say thank you to them, but not thank you and now your job is done and you have to retire. Thank you and now you have even more work to do because there are so many billion people that need to be, as he says, empowered. So this is a very powerful reframing and something which is missing from the discussion. And again, reading the book is also seeing a very, a very bright mind in action. And I found particularly interesting the way he framed it and the example he used from the vaccines or the antibiotics, which is how would you evaluate, how would you deal with someone who talks to you about vaccines or antibiotics, and they only give you the side effects, and they forgot to mention that they have saved millions and millions of lives. Yeah, I think this is an important point, and it's, it's particularly important because I think most people, you know, it's, it's really easy for us to take for granted all the benefits of modern civilization and, and just not, and literally to not even know all the ways that we depend on fossil fuel energy. I think it's, you know, in order to, like people just don't even have the historical perspective that you would have to have to just imagine how people used to live 200 years ago before industrial, you know, before the industrial revolution, before the advent of fossil fuel energy, you know, just the, the kinds of energy sources that we had and, and what those, those very primitive energy sources made possible. You, there's, one of the things that's super valuable about this book is there's literally like a hundred pages, a couple of chapters devoted to 
all the different ways that we use fossil fuels in our civilization and don't even realize it. And I think filling in that information for people is so valuable because there's this such a chasm of ignorance about it that we're, you know, we're, we're on a course to enact policies that'll do away with this, with these fuel sources. And we don't even realize what we'll be giving up because we just don't like there's so much ignorance about um, the how indispensable and how ubiquitous these sources are. I mean, just as this is just a little anecdote, but I wanted to mention this because I think it, it's very telling about our culture and, the, and this point that I'm making here. I was driving on the freeway uh, a couple of weeks ago and this Tesla goes by me in the carpool lane and it has a vanity license plate that says H8NCO2, so Hayton CO2. <laughs> now, the problem with this is, you know, it's still the case that 60% of the electricity in the United States is generated using fossil fuels, oil, coal, or natural gas. So, you know, Maybe this guy's got a solar panel on his roof and a Tesla power wall, but the reality is most people who are driving Teslas are driving cars that are powered by fossil fuels. So they're not hating CO2, they're using CO2. But even apart from that, I mean, you know, the idea that this car would even exist without fossil fuels is completely absurd. Like the manufacturing processes, the, I mean, the all the materials that go into the car that have to be mined, you know, this is heavy industrial machinery that does all this stuff you know and even the battery i mean you know there's all these rare earth minerals in the battery that are probably mined in china you know and even if, and and to be honest if this person does have solar panels on his roof to charge his car most of those solar panels are manufactured in china and they're not using solar panels to manufacture solar panels this is this is they're building china's building hundreds of coal-fired power plants all the time in order to, you know, in order to power the factories and the machinery that's making our pathetic solar panels. So, you know, it's it's the the disconnect. What what strikes me about an example like this is is the is the disconnect between what people think about their dependence on fossil fuels. So this guy can drive along thinking, oh, I'm driving a Tesla. I'm I'm you know part of the solution here when and and yet there's there's no recognition acknowledgement of the fact that all these things are are we're still it's still indispensably using fossil fuel energy um and and you know that that's a good thing like it's a good thing that we have cars and we can drive around we have transportation we have we have industry we have you know manufacturing like we need these things to survive what we need also is to recognize you know how much we're how much we're benefiting from the fossil fuels that make all this possible. So, I, I wanted to ask you, Nikos. Um, you just read this book in the last week. You know, I, I got a review copy of it so I could write my article. So I read it. I read it a while ago. But you know, uh, from your point of view, what were some of the things that you learned about the benefits of fossil fuels that you didn't know before reading the book? Because I, as I'm saying, I think this is one of the one of the most valuable things about the book is just filling in this ignorance that people have about all the different ways that we depend on and use fossil fuels. So what was, what was something and that not, you learned that you didn't know? So this book is useful, not only for someone who this is their first contact with, uh, with this topic. So I've been an avid consumer of Alex's uh, content since 2014. And yet, I learned many things from this book. So first of all, I loved The Moral Case for Fossil Fuel, the first book by, of Alex, so much that I was a bit hesitant in terms of jumping in the new book. I said, okay, how much better can it be? And yet it is much better. So it's 400 pages. As you said, I'd read it in five days. Here is one particular thing that I realized that I've never realized before reading this book. So when we hear about energy, we think about electricity we think about the lamp we think about hot water we might even think about our tesla and it makes sense to say okay how much energy do you need for these things so let's say we're in a country like greece there's uh, sun there's wind somehow at some point we'll be able to use the uh, quote renewables 
But what Alex makes, the point that he makes is, keep aside the fact that this is very questionable, that even for these small things, uh, sun and water can be the solution. But what about some sectors of our life and civilization and the economy that consume a lot of energy and require so much energy that that sun and, uh, and wind would never be able to replace them. One example, heavy duty transportation. Think about cargo ships. Think about uh, airplanes. How close are we to, uh, to substituting them with renewables? This is, an, and this is nowhere near. As Alex says, the only feasible theoretical alternative would be some form of portable nuclear energy, which is basically criminalized by the same what he calls knowledge system that has almost criminalized fossil fuels. And the other thing is, what about industrial processes? For example, heating uh, in factories that is required to create cement or plastics. This requires huge amounts of energy and amounts of energy that will never be able to be in the foreseeable future to be provided by sun and water, so, uh, sun and wind. So while you're reading this book, you realize that, wait a minute, this is not a topic which it's one of these topics where some people are wrong and it's infuriating. It makes our life a bit more difficult. I might have to pay a bit more tax. No, this is an issue which puts at risk our life as we know it. So in a way, you read this book and you become a bit angry. You become a bit, you realize this is urgent. This is something which I need to do something, or at least I need to understand what is the proper framework in this book. So my message to people is, even if you have consumed a lot of Alex's material and you think you know the, your topic, I would encourage you definitely to read this book because except from the fact that it provides all this information, again, seeing this mind, Alex's mind at work is something which is fascinating. And again, you will learn new things. Okay, so um, we wanted to make the point that you know that that the approach and the whole structure of the argument is different. He doesn't. He doesn't. Alex doesn't start by sort of refuting alarmist scares. He he starts by saying, "What are the positives? What are the benefits that we get from fossil fuels? We have to we have to know that if we're contemplating policies that are going to you know be aimed at eliminating them, we have to we have to be weighing the costs and benefits in order to make judgments like that." He does though. Um, he does though take up a lot of the standard kinds of claims that people make. And this is something that the other, the other books that I mentioned do also um, as well. And it is important to recognize that there is a huge gap between, you know, uh, between what we hear and what gets reported about, you know, what, what we hear in the reporting and the commentary about climate change. And, you know, that we have this sort of apocalyptic perspective that we get versus what, what is actually known What's what is the leading experts on these issues think what gets summarized in the sort of official reports by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC and other official reports. And it's important to know that there's a huge disconnect there, that there's, there's a huge gap between those things. Um, and I want to talk about that a little bit because uh, fossil future has some interesting things to say about why that gap exists, but let's start with an example. So, you know, if you, so take, take a, a typical kind of thing that would get brought up in discussions of climate change, like hurricanes or storms. Okay. If you just ask the average person is climate change leading to a world where storms are getting more deadly, more destructive, you know, that, that we're going to be, that this is part of this apocalyptic vision that we're going to be battling, you know, impossible to deal with hurricanes in our future. Most people would say, yeah, well, this, that's obvious, right? The, that's what the science says, right? But I think one of the things that's valuable about all four of these books that I, that we talked, that we're talking about a little bit is, um, you know, they all go to the source. They all look at, you know, what is actually summarized in the official reports? What do the leading experts say? And the reality is there's no, there, I mean, what you'll hear in the discussion is like, we're already seeing devastating effects, but the reality is if you look at the data about, you know, the historical trends about hurricanes, you know, hurricanes reaching the United States or people study this obviously worldwide, 
there really is no basis for it for being concerned that we're seeing any changes in uh, the, the intensity or the frequency of hurricanes. And this is what it says in the official reports. Now, sometimes when you get to the executive summaries of the official reports, the language will be a little different. They'll maybe, they'll maybe focus on parts of it where you could be seeing a trend or they'll, they'll, like, they'll, they'll um, use language that suggests that changes are coming or something like that. And then by the time it gets to news reports about the executive summaries, you know, it, it, the, the exaggeration gets a little worse. And then, you know, by the time you get to the popular discussion about it, you get this view that people have, well, her, you know, or that climate change is making hurricanes worse. So there's this, there's a distorting process that happens when you go from what the researchers actually know on this issue to what gets communicated in the public. And it's an interesting question to ask, why does this happen? So there's a, the first part of, of Alex's book um, goes into a discussion of this issue. And you started, uh, you started referencing a little bit. So why don't you take us into that discussion, Nikos? So just a comment on, on what you just said, though, because Alex's book is so radical. Is not as some many people would expect because he says everything you know about the science is wrong. On the contrary, Alex says we have to be very careful and we have to pay attention to what the science says. But he makes the point that between, quote, science and yourself, there are four stages. The first stage is scientists who are doing the research. Then it's second stage, which are some other people, not the scientists, who collect all the evidence of the scientists and kind of put them together and disseminate them, he says. Then there's a group of different people who communicate to the average Joe, to me and you. I mean, you have a PhD in astrophysics, so maybe not you. You would, you would be able to understand them anyway. But to people like me who are not familiar with, with technical science, who communicate this message. And then there's a fourth layer of people who say what needs to be done. So what Alex attacks is what he calls this system of knowledge and not, quote, the science. So this is something very important. We need to make sure we understand before we, we, before we proceed. So then Alex asks, how is it then that this system can be so consistently wrong? Wrong in what way? Wrong in the way it evaluates energy and evaluates fossil fuels. And he claims that the problem is that this system has a long that has a wrong standard has a is this where you where where we where we're getting well, yeah, let, about let, let's the... just pause, let's just pause on the knowledge system itself before we get to yeah. that question because i think this is an important thing to say a little more about it's the 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 um there's a there's a very rich and detailed analysis in the book of how expert knowledge is developed and disseminated. Um, and I think too often what we get in the discussion of climate change, uh, these kinds of issues, is we get this false alternative where you have the sort of climate denier who just dismisses all expert, all, all expert knowledge, all scientific, you know, and just says it's all a hoax or whatever. But on the other hand, you get people who say we, we you know we have to follow the science and what they mean by following the science is parroting the the uh, conclusions of you know, what uh, of people that our culture is sort of designated as experts on these issues that may not actually reflect what is really known by the scientists so it, um, rather than being caught by this false alternative, which you know often falls along the kind of tribal lines that we see in our culture today, the this idea of recognizing that what we don't so one of the things that Alex says in his book is like we don't we don't hear directly what experts think. What we are we we are told what experts think um, by means of a process that goes through this whole knowledge system. Um, now, I wanted to mention um, that this idea that the, there's there's this is sort of, this is an epistemological issue 
that is very deep. So how is it that we as non-scientists, non-experts, non, you know, public intellectuals or whatever, how should we uh, think about the claims that we hear about what scientists think and how do we evaluate scientific claims? I wanted to mention that I, I think, um, so the philosopher Greg Salmieri has a, has a lecture on this issue called How to Be an Objective Consumer of Science. We'll put a link to it at the end of the show. And I, I oh, there, I'll put a link to it up now, thanks. Um, I wanted to mention this to people because I, 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure that this lecture, I know that Alex on his first book, Moral Case for Fossil Fuels, worked closely with Greg. And I'm sure that this, this um, lecture and the thinking that Greg has done on this issue is influential on Alex. And I think uh, I wanted to call this out as well because I think it's really valuable. This is a valuable lecture in and of itself. But build, I think Alex is building on this work and building on this, on this idea. And the discussion that you get in Fossil Future about how our knowledge system works and how expert knowledge gets created and disseminated, it's a, it's a very nuanced perspective. And I think it brings a lot of insight to this discussion for people to understand and, and, and to kind of pause when you hear things that are reported about the science or what people say, it's, it's really helpful to have this more nuanced understanding of how this knowledge system works and what kind of processes are at play so that you can be a little more critical, a little more skeptical, and maybe do a little more digging and find out, you know, are we really getting the full context? Are we really hearing the full story? So I think this concept of the knowledge system and the analysis that Alex gives, building on work of other people here, uh, I, I just think is really valuable and something, it's, it's another way in which Fossil Future sort of stands out among recent books on this issue because they, although they touch on these questions and they recognize that there's distortion that happens, they don't have as much to say about why that distortions happen and what are the processes at work that give rise to those distortions. Now, or even, um, even worse, they might give some explanations for these distortions that are quite simplistic and don't help us to understand the issue. For example, that uh, there's a lot of money involved, so that's why research on climate uh, goes into one direction. So I know we're going to mention later why Alex's uh, explanation is different, but the fact that we understand something beyond that... So because saying that something is only the result of all of the money undermines the importance that ideas plays in how people understand the topic and how people are buying into or not buying into a topic. So this is this is another reason why Alex's book is superior and, and a must read. And also must read even if someone is not very much interested in energy. Because again, it teaches you how to think about topics in a way, in a methodology that you can apply to issues beyond beyond energy. So I mentioned that it helped me understand better the whole discussion around the vaccines or the discussions around other issues. But let's get back to you, Keith, because I don't want to lead the discussion to other directions. No, no, that's, yeah. So now, now I think we can get to the question that you wanted to get to is, is if we have this understanding that um, information that we hear is sort of processed through this knowledge system, that doesn't that still doesn't get to the question of why is it so consistently pushing in one direction pushing in the direction of climate alarmism like you know in other areas you know let's say in in i mean i know about uh uh gravitational physics when you hear reports about recent discoveries made with you know gravitational wave detectors they aren't distorted we're not getting like false uh, view of them that are lacking the full context, we get, you know, you have the scientists who do, who, who, are, who, are, who are making these discoveries, they get reported by science journalists, and it's generally pretty accurate. <laughs> so why is it that on this issue, things get distorted? On environmental issues, things get distorted so radically. And so you started and, to talk about, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and they get distorted because we view them under a particular prism. So the prism through which you view a topic has to do with how you evaluate something, it has to do with what is your standard. Let me give you a very 
a simple example. Let's say that someone's ideology or religion is that uh, uh, poverty is something which is good. Then if you evaluate where the world has been going in the last 200 years, you would say the world has been going in a very bad place or the world is, uh, or the world is, uh, is, 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 go- is, is worse than it used to be. So it's very important that was what is our standard? And there are two ways through which you can view this issue. The one way is to say that my goal is to minimize impact on nature. And this is the prevailing prism, the prism that says that any impact we have in nature, irrespective of whether this impact is good for us or bad for us, that this impact is bad. Now, under this prism, obviously, fossil fuels are very bad because fossil fuels help us to master nature and help us to change nature to our benefit. There's a different prism, which is the human flourishing prism. Under this prism, what we want is to make nature more safe and hospitable towards our flourishing. Part of this flourishing involves living in a safe environment, but also involves other things such as being able to uh, to be safe, to be productive, and to live a flourishing life. So the view and the prism and the standard through which you judge a phenomenon matters. So the reason why we see this consistently pessimist view on our relation to the environment and this very negative view towards fossil fuels is because we judge them by the standard, not of how much they make our life better, but by how much they add to our impact on nature. Because again, the standard is that our our impact on nature is bad and that nature is this fragile entity which without our intervention is good and hospitable but when we start messing with it it becomes uh, it becomes unhospitable not hospitable and dangerous so this is what alex is saying that the prism which has dominated the mainstream about our interaction with nature is the prism that says that we should have as few as little impact as possible and therefore it makes sense that under this prism not only fossil fuels are bad, but even, quote, safer in terms of not having, let's say, the side effects of uh, CO2, like, for example, emissions. So even other forms of energy, like nuclear or hydroelectric energy, are also to be evaluated as negative. Why? Because they maximize our impact on nature. And under the dominant prism, maximizing our impact on nature is bad, irrespective of whether it makes our life better or worse. I want to, so I agree with that. I want to push back on, on one word that you're using there, and I'll say why. And that's the word prism. So I, I, w- I would be very cautious to view the idea of a moral standard. I wouldn't use the word prism because that has the connotation that, that a moral standard is inherently like a distorting mechanism. We can never know, it's sort of a, it, we can never know the way reality really is. We can only know the way reality is as filtered by some distorting mechanism. And uh, what I would want to emphasize is the, it's true that we, we interpret the things that we, we evaluate things according to this moral standard, but we can judge whether that moral standard itself is true based on the facts of reality. And so part of what Alex is arguing and part of what's so powerful here is that the, uh, it's, it's something that people never think to do to raise the question of what is the moral standard that we're using to judge all of these things? What is the standard that we're using to judge our use of fossil fuels or the possible climate impacts or nuclear energy? What is the standard that we're using? And the idea that the the operative standard that dominates our culture is this idea of avoiding all impacts on nature um, is not something that people necessarily identify explicitly. So the problem is, that they rely on this moral standard and they reach conclusions and evaluations based on this standard without even realizing it. And that's part of the problem here. Um, So I agree with you 
the I think the the example of nuclear energy is particularly telling. I think at one point in a podcast you described this as sort of a litmus test of of people's views on this issue because you would think that if people were really as concerned about climate change as they say they are, and like the leaders and the po people driving policy on this issue, you know, nuclear doesn't, you know, nuclear energy doesn't generate carbon emissions. So they should be 100% behind the expansion of nuclear energy, you know, as a way of reducing our carbon emissions. But the fact that many, and this, I think there's, I think this is starting to change. And I think, you know, the, the work that people like Michael Schellenberger are, are doing is, is helping to move the conversation on this um, because he's a strong advocate of nuclear power, um, you know, from within the so-called environmentalist community. Um, but the point is uh, the fact that the predominant position is still anti-nuclear, even though, you know, supposedly getting rid of carbon emissions is, is necessary to prevent Armageddon, that is really telling that the the pro-human goal of sort of saving us from disaster is not really what's operative here. The operative goal is this anti-impact goal. And it, the, whole, it's the, the whole idea of like an environmental footprint or a carbon footprint and, you know, trying to get a measure of what is your total, as, as a human being, what is your total impact on nature? And your goal should be to minimize that as much as possible. I've written, you know, I, I've written on, on this issue in the past. Um, and it's, it's, it's the idea that it, the, it, the fact that this is the operative standard and the, um, it's important to identify it and to recognize that it's a really anti-human standard. Because if, if, the, if the primary moral goal is to eliminate human impact, I mean, ultimately, what does that mean? That means eliminating human activity, eliminating all human, you know, impact on the world. Um, so, uh, so identifying that these moral standards are at play is a really important point. And um, as you said, what's valuable about fossil future is that Alex doesn't just recognize and identify the anti-impact standard, he has an alternative to offer. And that's what he calls the human flourishing framework. So did you want to say a little more about, about the, the human flourishing framework and what he's arguing there? Yes. So the human flourishing framework, the, the, the standard, which means how we judge something is, does it promote uh, the well-being, first of all, the survival, but also the well-being and the flourishing of human beings, which means, does it promote making uh, the environment more livable? What does livable mean? It means more conductive to our flourishing, to use the terms that Alex is using. So this is a completely different standard because this standard recognizes that in order for us to survive, to be safe in nature, to enjoy nature even, and to live a productive, long and productive life, we have to intervene in nature and we have to change, radically change nature because the environment we see is not an environment which is naturally safe and abundant. It's an environment which is dangerous and deficient in itself. We have to change it and intervene in it to make it, to make it, uh, to make it again, to make it accommodating to our flourishing. And Keith, while I was reading it, I was thinking, which are the most beautiful places I visited in Greece? Some mountains, some seaside places. And I was trying to think, how, con how, uh, how accommodating to my happiness would these places be without any human intervention, without electricity, without a road to, to get to these places, without the way to get help if, I don't know, you're beaten by a bug or whatever. So suddenly you realize that, oh, even on the issue of appreciating nature, this element of the human impact of nature or nature is very, very important because changing nature is what allows us to enjoy nature. And changing nature is also what allows us all the other things such as having a, a safer life, a, a more prosperous life, 
more people being able to access uh, amenities, uh, have uh, electricity. So things that are start from being issues of life and death, such as getting access to electricity or to a hospital which has electricity, or other issues such as saving time and uh, engaging in hobbies and living a more prosperous life. So the moment you realize this, you realize that fighting for uh, fossil fuels is not something that you have to do half-heartedly, but it is something which is very, very foundational for the world we live in and for the things that we take for granted. But we might lose. I mean, if you see my energy bill this month, you realize how these things are not for granted. And other people are missing people in the developing world and they desperately need in order to live a good life. So this is the human flourishing standard, the standard that says that nature is to be uh, is to be commanded, to use this famous line, so as to lead to human flourishing. Yeah, I think this is an important point. And even, even when it comes to risks from climate disasters, one of the things that Alex stresses in the book is the is just the extent to which fossil fuels have resulted in, he, call, he calls it climate mastery, our ability to build a world in which we're safer from climate disasters than human beings have ever been in all of human history. So one of the so one of the uh, data sets that Alex looks at in the book is how is climate related deaths and how those have changed over the last century. So maybe we can get that graph up. So this is uh, so this chart is showing climate related disaster deaths, um, deaths from drought, flood, wildfires, uh, uh, storms, you know, uh, temperature extremes, you know, these, the, all of these kinds of things that we hear constantly are getting worse, you know, and that are, that are part of this climate apocalypse that we're facing. But the reality is, you know, climate, de climate, these climate related deaths, uh, have dropped by something like 98% in the last hundred years. You know, we're 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 safer, especially in the developed world. And actually, if you look at the data comparing, um, you know, risks from like flooding and hurricanes and, and that sort of thing in the developed world versus the undeveloped world, the, the difference is even more dramatic. And the point is that it's 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 fossil fuels and the infrastructure and technology and uh, things that we are that we've been able to um, Things the the world that we've been able to build using these sources of energy are keep us far safer from climate. Like so, if we're concerned, you know, if people are if people are con this is part of the argument. If people even if people are concerned about what might be coming as a result of climate change, the solution is expanding our use of fossil fuels to expand uh, the the products of industrial civilization that keep us safe from climate and allow us to master the climate. Um, you know, this uh, one example of this uh, that I gave a, a month ago on the podcast as well is just think about ex just think about temperature extremes in particular. Think about extreme cold. So more people die from extreme cold than from extreme heat. And if you think about how you know how did people keep warm, you know, a uh, hundred, two hundred years ago before we had fossil fuel energy to do it. You know, you basically. Uh, I, I came across a data point once that where something like in, in, in the 19th century in America, people who are out on the frontier, they literally had to chop like thousands and thousands of pounds of firewood every year just so they wouldn't freeze to death in the winter. And so you made the point, Nikos, that, you know, we go to these harsh places, the mountains and all this, and we, and we think, wow, if I had to survive out here, this would not... I wouldn't view this as beautiful and magical, you know, getting out into wilderness. I view it as terrifying. Uh, and I, you know, that you can make a similar point here. We, we sit in our comfortable modern homes, looking at the snow falling during a blizzard and we sing winter wonderland, you know, and how wonderful it is to be in a winter wonderland. People 150 years ago did not think it was wonderful to be in a winter wonderland. They thought it was terrifying and they had to, work like crazy so they wouldn't freeze to death. I mean, and, and, you know, that's the kind of example you can multiply a billion times that just underscores how indispensable and how crucial 
uh, fossil fuel energy is to, you know, uh, even keeping us safe from climate related risks. Right. So we've talked a lot, Keith, about this, uh, about the framework of how Alex uh, views uh, this topic. So as you mentioned in the beginning, Alex has worked in the Ayn Rand Institute. Alex has been influenced about objectivism. So I think it would be good to mention towards the end, how is objectivism operating on the background in a way of the book and in the background of his thought in terms of making come up with this very clarifying and very, very morally clear way to view this, uh, to view this topic. And how the, again, quite often we say objectivism is, is a super weapon, is a tool which is, it's, which is so helpful in making us understand the world, also in our personal life, but also in how we view and frame issues. So do you want to talk a bit about how objectivism plays out in the background of the book? Yeah, so we talked already about this issue of the knowledge system and and the kind of epistemological issues that come up there. Where I think there, I think you know, the influence of uh, of objectivism and objectivist philosophers. We mentioned Greg Salmieri and his talk on how to be an objective consumer of science. I think so. That that's one. Uh, you know, the, the idea of really looking at um, how knowledge gets created and disseminated. You know, the the is is one practical application. I think I think you can see the influence of objectivism throughout the book. Um, if you're knowledgeable about objectivism, it's pretty it's pretty apparent. Um, I think the other really critical place where where the influence of objectivism becomes really strongly pronounced is is on this question of moral standards. Most people just don't even think to ask the question of what are they, and we, we talked about this before a little bit, of what, are the, what are the moral standards that are operative in our, uh, in our thinking and in, in the way we make evaluations about things? This, this human flourishing framework that um, Alex is advocating for and presenting and, and elaborating on, what, what, what is that framework, what, what is that the idea of taking human flourishing as a standard and applying it to this issue, like he goes into great detail about what that implies and what it looks like in the context of climate and energy. But I think in the end, that is is sort of an, is an expression of Ayn Rand's moral perspective that human life is the standard of value, that man's life is the standard of value in morality. And that, and recognizing that explicitly, and thinking about what it implies for all aspects of human life, you know, that's a foundational principle of the objectivist ethics. Um, so, and I, and I, and so part of the you you talk about objectivism being kind of a superpower. Just the 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 whole idea, like I, I don't think without without Ayn Rand's perspective on ethics, and without the kind of fundamental questions that she raises about ethics. The idea of asking what is the, what are the standards that are operative here? I just don't think people would have that. This is a very Ayn Rand kind of question to raise, and I think having the perspective of the objectivist ethics makes that a, a question that's sort of top of mind. Um, and then, and having that standard, you know, identified explicitly, that's what makes it important then to recognize what are the we have to look at the full context here what are the costs and the benefits because if you're on this anti-impact framework you know the question of what are the benefits of fossil fuels doesn't um isn't really relevant because if the standard is avoiding human impacts on nature there are no benefits to fossil fuels because everything we use them for as you, you said this earlier the reason we use them is to expand our ability to have an impact on nature to build a world that improves human life. So there are no benefits from the anti-impact standard, but as soon as you are asking the question from the point of view of what is it that serves human life, then the question, you do have to look objectively at the costs and the benefits because there might be costs and that has a negative impact on human life. If there are benefits, you have to know what those are in order to understand their implications for human flourishing. And so, so the, you know, having this moral standard almost drives the need for a more objective analysis of the issue. 
um, with regard, whether it's regard to the benefits, the costs and benefits of, of fossil fuels, the possible risks or, or um, you know, that, that uh, occurs as a result of climate change, you know, it just drives you to be more objective because the standard of human life um, requires an objective understanding of these things. So I think those are just, those are some ways. I think if we, it would be interesting to get Alex on the show and ask him, you know, what does he think about the ways in which objectivism influenced uh, his thinking on this book? Um, I think there's one more way, though, and uh, it also relates to a question that I see on the on the chat. So someone asks, what about scientists who have, uh, how about the funding and the lot of money that are on the table on climate research? So, and we also see it in some of the books that criticize the dominant narrative on climate change that say that there's a lot of incentive for scientists to lead research that lead them towards uh, conclusions that are in agreement with climate catastrophizing. So Ayn Rand says that, uh, she doesn't say this uh, as a quote, but it's not that money make the world go round, ideas make the world go round. So the most important reason why this uh, framework, this way of seeing the world, this standard by which we judge the world is uh, the anti-impact standard is because people have bought into it as being the moral the, the moral choice, as the, this being the moral, uh, the moral way to lead a life and the moral way to, uh, for, for the society to run. This is why we see so many idealistic young people jumping on the one of environmentalists. These people definitely don't do it for the money. These people do it because they think that this is the moral decision. This is a moral campaign. People want to have ideals. People want to feel that they do the right thing. And this is why it is a big mistake, strategic mistake, to concede that, yeah, environmentalists are correct when it comes to their aims, but the means are sometimes not, uh, not good. Again, we see this in so many areas. How many times supporters of capital and saying, yeah, the left, they, they are, they, their heart is in the right place, but uh, the means are not right. No, you have to say that we have first and foremost to judge what is their moral standard? And here we see that when it comes to the system of knowledge that is the dominant when it comes to the environment, the moral standard is the one which is anti-humanist. And therefore, if you care about human flourishing, you have to dismiss it. And to do this and explicitly. I think, yes, and I, and I, and I think the, the other thing that's so powerful about this approach is that as soon as you make these issues explicit, and as soon as you raise this question of what is what standard should we be using to evaluate here? Should we be using the anti-impact standard or the human flourishing standard? Most people, once that question is made explicit and raised as an explicit question in their mind, recognize that the operative standard should be human life here, that it shouldn't be not having an impact on nature, it should be what is important for human beings. And I think that this is one of the things that is so powerful about Alex's book and why it's so important that it get a wide hearing because, you know, it might seem like this is an impossible battle. I mean, the, the, the climate alarmist perspective is so, so predominant and, you know, governments around the world and policymakers, like the whole weight of the culture is pushing in this, in a certain direction that, you know, climate apocalypse is coming and we have to eliminate our use of fossil fuels and it's pushing us in this direction. You might think it's hopeless. You know, how can one person or one book make a difference? But I think what's really hopeful um, is that it's by making the, the issue of the, the moral ideas that are driving the debate explicit, that is, that is the super weapon here. And there's a, there's, Ayn Rand makes a point, if we can get this quote up, um, and she has an article called The Anatomy of Compromise, where she talks about, well, let me just read the quote here, because I think this is, this is what is so powerful about the approach that Alex is taking. She says, when opposite, principle, when opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. When they're not clearly defined, but are hidden or evaded, it works to the advantage of the irrational side. Let me just pause. So... Up until now, I think this has been the state of affairs when it comes to mo it, most people's understanding of environmental issues, that 
the the operative standards are not clearly defined. They're sort of and they're sort of hidden. The idea that the goal, the moral goal, is to eliminate human impacts on nature. Every now and then you'll see people who will say things that make this apparent that that's what is really driving them, but they they don't pound the pavement with this goal. This is not they don't crusade for this as their standard. It's sort of hidden. It's not made explicit. And part of what's so important here is that is calling out people who are on this anti-impact standard and saying explicitly, this is what's actually operative here. And, and that's irrational and destructive. And we need to replace it with a better moral standard. So, so, you know, but, and by, so by, by with it, with, with the standards not being openly defined, it works to the advantage of the irrational side by, by making the standards clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. Let me continue the quote here. In order to win, the rational side of any controversy requires that its goals be understood. It has nothing to hide since reality is its ally. The irrational side has to deceive, to confuse, to evade, to hide its goals. Fog, murk, and blindness are not the tools of reason. They're the only tools of irrationality. I think that says a lot about how this climate debate has been conducted for 50 years. And I think what gives me hope is that uh, um, the arguments in this book are made so persuasively and all the important issues um, that need to be made in order to make these issues explicit and openly define them um, are made in this book. And it's, a, it's such a powerful tool for changing the debate um, and that's 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 one of the things that I think is is most valuable about and what and why I wanted to call it out. I guess we are pretty much at time here. Did you have any final thoughts? Uh, no, the final that thought is that again, the conclusion is uh, the conclusion is very very powerful. So you read the book and you might think, okay, there is no hope, but the conclusion is like a plot twist on whether there is a hope or not. So again, just to encourage people, even if you have read the uh, moral case for fossil fuels. Fossil Future is definitely worth your time, so I encourage people to read it. Again, even if energy is not your first uh, matter of interest, seeing Alex's mind at work is a very valuable experience. Okay, so why don't we draw a line here? Uh, we're going to hop over to Clubhouse. I think the, the Clubhouse is already streaming. Um, We've been streaming this broadcast onto Clubhouse. Once we end here, we're going to hop over onto Clubhouse and we'll continue the discussion there. So feel free to join us at the Ayn Rand Club over there. Uh, what else do we have? Yeah, so check out my review because some of the points that uh, we talked about today are you know, are things that come out of this review that I wrote. So take a look at my review of Fossil Future and the comparison with the other books. Um, some of the, you know, I, I write a lot about these issues as well, and some of the points that uh, we talked about came out there. So check out, uh, if you go to new I, this this tiny URL here, bit.ly, New Ideal Lockage, that's my author's page on New Ideal, and you can check out some of the things that I've written on environmental issues. Um, I meant, we mentioned this talk by Greg Salmieri, How to Be an Objective Consumer of Science. That's really valuable on this question of how to think about expert knowledge. Uh, so that's that's a really valuable uh, resource. And, um, you know, as usual, if you enjoyed this podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, click the bell, get notifications. I We have a, there is a podcast next week. I don't know if we have a title, but I believe it's uh, Ben Bayer and Ankar Gatti are going to be talking about Kathleen Stock, the philosopher who's writing about gender issues and things like that. I don't know if we have a title yet, but uh, but be sure to check out the podcast next week because that'll be a very interesting discussion. Um, so, you know, again, if you're watching the recording, please like, comment, share. We always want to attract new viewers, trying to keep trying to grow our YouTube channel. Consider doing the same if you're watching on Facebook. If you have any questions, comments uh, about today's episode, or you have any suggestions for future episodes, go ahead and shoot us an email at newideal at We read all of them. We reply to many. 
some of our podcast uh, topics came out of questions or comments that people have sent us. So be sure to write to us and we look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Well, Nikos, thanks for joining me today. And uh, thanks, I'll see you in a few minutes over on Clubhouse. See you in Clubhouse.